I'm Sean Crawford, host of Varsity House Podcast. And on this episode, we have a very special guest, Kim Miali, um, Rock Nation Sports NFL agent and general counsel. Kim, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me, Sean. It's it's great to be here with you today. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, obviously we're talking about just some of your clients off camera, you know, some dear friends of mine that you um, rep, but, you know, obviously, started your career in 2011 as an agent and you've just been breaking barriers since. And so even back in 2018, the NFL draft, their client Saquon went number two overall. And so at that moment, it was the highest a player, you know, represented by a woman has ever been selected. Kind of just discuss the rooting, the recruiting process that goes into, you know, getting a client, but then also how important, you know, was landing Saquon for your career. Sure. So I would say, you know, the recruiting process is very case by case specific, especially here at Roth Nation, because we really don't recruit a lot of players. We like to keep the roster kind of small um, and we cherry pick the players we're going to go after. And particularly with Saquon, what happened, I can share kind of that story, how I ended up recruiting him. I was actually recruiting Juju Smith Schuster, who was a receiver from USC in the 2017 draft class. And I went to the Rose Bowl, um, you know, in anticipation of signing Juju after the game and could not help but notice Saquon Barkley because he was like lightning in a bottle out there. Like he just jumped out to anyone watching that game that he was a superstar. Um, and so I kind of set my mind that for the 2018 draft class, he would be my focus. And, you know, I ended up having a small connection because Juju was on the show, Hey Rookie, and the executive producer of the show is a, is a dear friend of mine named Shannon Furman, who went to Penn State and knew Saquon well. And so it all worked out and we kind of had planned, hey, listen, if I get Saquon, we'll have him on the show, we'll get to work together again. Um, and it worked out perfectly. And essentially what I did is I just focused on Saquon Barkley in that draft class. So I, you know, spent all of my time and attention recruiting him, went to every single Penn State game, developed a relationship with him and his family. And I think, you know, that's what ultimately won it at the end of the day. I don't think a lot of agents or agencies would give the, the green light to an agent to just hone in and focus on one player, even if it's a star player like Saquon. Um, but because I was able to do that, we built genuine relationships and, you know, we're like family, you know, he and I and his family. So that brings me to my next point, you know, obviously in the field where you work with a tons of tons of athletes, you know, you get to understand their background and their families. Mm -hmm. um, what's your background? And, you know, what growing up, what was home like? Because Obviously, you got to you get, everyone knows the athlete stories and they get highlighted on ESPN or draft day and things like that. But, you know, people don't talk about the people who represent them, the people who help them on their day to days and things like that, because I'm sure, you know, your foundation, your structure had to be strong, you know, because you got to relate to a lot of different personalities um, who may be at the top, you know, at their le at, at the top of the level. Um, at their specific, you know, industry. So talk about your background and just what was home life like growing up. Sure. sure. So my background doesn't necessarily lend itself to becoming an NFL agent. Um, I have a sister. My dad did play high school um, football for what it's worth. Obviously, I didn't know him then, but I see his yearbook pictures. So my dad's always loved football, but he was blessed with two daughters instead of sons. So um, he really just would watch games and he was super passionate about the Patriots and everyone in New England for the most part is Patriot you know, nation and their fans. Um, and my dad was just more passionate about football than any other sport. So I did grow up in an environment where football was a big deal. Um, but I wasn't much of an athlete myself um, growing up. So I can't say that I can um, relate necessarily to what my clients go through from a physical standpoint. Um, but the town that I'm from and my family, um, it's a very working class town. My dad's work ethic is incredible. He had two jobs for most of um, you know, my life as a, as a kid in the household with him. 
um, and went above and beyond just to provide for our family. And I think that that work ethic was instilled in me and kind of gave me the confidence to go and pursue being an agent while working full-time as a lawyer, because I'd seen my dad work two jobs for so long. And that was kind of, you know, normal in our family for, you know, that, that kind of, that kind of sacrifice. And so I'd like to think that the work ethic that my family instilled in me, and then again, my town, everyone, it, it's a very working class place. No one has been handed anything in life. And so, you know, there's a certain grittiness, I think, to people from my hometown that, again, has been instilled in me. And I think it's helped me to get to where I am. I was reaching out to a couple of your guys um, that you read, you know, like Ronnie and Romeo and Julian. And I was asking Ronnie, I was like, is there anything interesting that she might have told you, you know, draft day or, you know, since you've known her? But he was like, she wears a suit every day. And so. <laughs> That's uh, not for <laughs> Ronnie. It talks about, you know, but that speaks to your, you know, professionalism and, you know, the way you work and what you and how, and how you just, you know, talk about the way, you know, you were brought up and just the, the people you yeah. were. Um, does, where, where does, I was going to say, like, where does that come from? But do you ever feel like, you know, dismissed by colleagues um, because of, you know, the route that you had to take or because of the background that you that you came up in and you know not necessarily close to sports or having a family member you know at the top level of any professional sports do you ever feel like that you've been dismissed by colleagues or you know anything like that yeah i mean there's definitely um pardon me that always feels like i have to prove myself because i am like an outsider that broke into this industry um, but I think I just use it as motivation because it just means I have to prepare that much harder and um, go the extra mile to to prove that I belong here and that I have what it takes the skill set to be an agent in this league and, and do my very best for my clients. Um, I want to go back to the Ronnie comment though because Ronnie is hilarious and I wear blazers a lot, so I'm going to just correct him on the suit. And he thinks I'm always in the same outfit because he can't differentiate between the different blazers. So mm -hmm. I have to correct Ronnie. And you can see today, see, I'm not in, in a suit. So right, yeah. not, he's not right. No, I love Ronnie. But and you talk about, you know, breaking into a space. Um, when you broke in, you, I feel like you took center stage. You know, obviously in 2013, you were backed by Jay-Z. You were backed by Rock Nation. You know, a name that gets you in, you know, pretty much any door probably. <laughs> And so did that add any pressure to you at all? Um, it did. Um, in a sense, it took pressure off, right? Because prior to, I was at a smaller agency with limited resources. And before that, I was on my own with no resources. Right. So to come in here and get the opportunity to have this name behind me now and really limited, limitless resources was amazing. But to your point, it's it's such an incredible company that's had so many great achievements to want to come in here and be able to do the same in the football space. There are certainly expectations placed on myself and within the company to come in and, and to be a success and to have some big names attached to us pretty quickly because that's what they had done. They had actually already had a basketball and baseball division and the first players to join were Kevin Durant and Robinson Cano. So those are pretty big names right. to follow and try and kind of follow suit in the football space. And then even, I'm going to read off a few stats because I think, you know, obviously you coming in and being the head of Rock Nation, you know, football division, female you know, NFL agents make up less than 5% of the NFL PA, you know, certified, and then also 3% um with total active you know players playing and so just hearing those numbers and hearing those you know so statistics to till this day um and then you know being handed the keys to rock nation football division just talk about you know what that meant to you and then also what that meant to just you know anyone following you i mean it was life-changing and honestly the opportunity i got here at rock nation I have to say, um, it was the principals here that really believed in me and took a leap of faith. So I'm incredibly and, and eternally indebted to them for, for believing in me. Um, our CEO at Rob Nation is a woman. 
Desiree Perez, she runs everything um, relative to Rock Nation and by virtue of us being a subsidiary in sports, she runs sports as well. And ev every venture that, that Jay has is really, you know, has, has Desiree at the helm. And so they, I think this company in particular, thinks outside of the box and mm -hmm. isn't afraid to take a chance on not just the clients that we sign on the roster, but even on the talent they bring in to represent um, their clients. And I think they look at good people um, who they can entrust to, to take care of the clients the way they want us to. That was so important to the principals here that this was more than just a job that whoever they brought in, that this was going to be really like a vocation in a, in a life because that's what we preach to our clients that this is 24 seven and we don't work with um, dozens and dozens of athletes because we want to be able to give them the kind of attention that they deserve. Um, and we want it to be different than the other agencies that just go out and represent hundreds of players, really. You mentioned Desiree, and, you know, obviously I, I reached out to my guys, like I mentioned, to get some inside info. And Romeo, you know, mentioned Desiree and um, just, you know, how much of a mentor she's been to you you know, how much she's helped you along your journey. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of just, you know, shine light on that relationship and, you know, how impactful she's been to not only you, but also to Rock Nation that you touched mm -hmm. on. Yeah, well, she leads by example. So she's the first one in the building and the last one out mm -hmm. um, every day. Um, she she will have a meeting at 6.30 in the morning if necessary. And that she doesn't bat an eyelash at that. That's very standard for her and her day. Um, and so I think just seeing the dedication she has to the work and the clients, mm -hmm. you can't help but be inspired by it and want to give back and do the same because she's doing it um, at such a high level with so many, every everyone on the music side and the sports side, she deems her clients. So if I can do it with a group of 10 players, um, I should be able to, if she's doing it with a hundred. Right. So definitely inspires me and um, just her enthusiasm in the company and she's constantly finding new ways for us to get better and to kind of disrupt and, and do something different that no one else is doing. I think this next question is very important, you know, obviously for you, but also Rock Nation and what Jay-Z has done, you know, his partnership with the NFL and, you know, knowing that there's few women in the NFL culture, you know, and obviously the Daniel Snyder situation that's going on, you know, currently, how can we as a society progress and make sure, you know, women's voices are heard within facilities around the league and then also just, you know, around the world? Mm -hmm. I think that there's been progress. So even though there's, you know, there's still those news stories that come out and, and you know, it's still going on that there's a lot of negative um, workplace kind of environments out there for women. I think, um, to balance that and to be positive, there's been a lot of change too. You've seen teams, I think, make more of a concerted effort to bring women in to positions of power, whether it's the Raiders doing it, um, their ownership, like the Buffalo Bills and their ownership. Um, and then on the broadcasting side, um, and like I mentioned, my friend Shannon Furman, who she, she moved up to executive producer and director of Hard Knocks and hey rookie so there's definitely women who've made a difference in the space and i think continuing to do that and showcase women who are doing it so that young women coming up can see that it, it, it these are attainable jobs you don't have to feel like well it's not possible because look at the statistics it's five percent female agents um i think the more they see the women who are agents and you see that there are there's a handful of female agents now um, in the NFL who have done great work at a very high level with high profile players. And you didn't see that 10 years ago. So there's been progress made. And I think we just have to continue to work towards that. And women within the league um, need to continue to help younger women who are building as well. So I try and, you know, from an intern standpoint, or just even if someone reaches out to me and wants to get advice, try and be a mentor and give back the same way it was done for me as I was coming up in the business. Right. No, that, I mean, obviously that's a, a huge thing. And um, I'm sure you're, you know, very connected to the space and being able to help out 
you know, the younger you know, generation that, are, that, are, that is following you. Um, I do want to touch on, and this is a question just for, you know, an agent. Um, I feel like I always hear about the deals that, you know, do get done, you know, all the, the you know, the, the max, the max contracts and record breaking contracts and things like that. But I'm actually curious, are there failures as an agent? Because, you know, I, I played at Notre Dame. So as a former player, I understand the failures that an athlete goes through, you know, um, whether it be, you know, injuries, whether it be a drop pass, anything like that. But as an agent, you may pursue several, you know, prospects in an upcoming draft and hopefully, you know, land one or two. But is are there any, you know, failures that an agent, you know, has to go through? Absolutely. Um, the recruiting side in particular, I would say sometimes and I'm guilty of this, I've spent a lot of time recruiting a player that probably was never going to be a good fit for Rock, and we weren't a good fit for him. And I probably should have identified that early on because it would have saved me some time and energy and the player that too. But sometimes it's just um, you end up realizing it was not going to be a good fit. So if you can get that impression early on and, and save yourself that time and energy, then that's great. So that's one failure on the recruiting side. Um, cause there are some players that when it comes down to it at the end, just care about the financials, meaning who's going to, you know, things happen. They take bags of cash. Like this is real. Like people just write a check just to get someone to sign or reduce commissions so low that you can't even, you know, really run a business that way. Mm -hmm. So, and some players that's, that's the most important thing. It's not about the quality necessarily of the representation, but it's a little short-sighted in my view. Um, but it's, who's going to give me the quote unquote best deal right now. Um, so that's certainly on the recruiting side, the mistakes that you can make on the contract side. I think something that agents can make mistakes on and need to be cognizant of is timing. Timing is everything. And if you have a player that, you know, um, for instance, has an injury that's going to have to be addressed like in the off season, you've got a really good offer on the table and you maybe would want to hold out for a little more, but you've got to make that judgment call that, Hey, we should probably take this deal because if we wait, you're probably going to lose value if, if you don't get it at the right time. So it worked in our favor with Ronnie Stanley. Um, you know, I knew he was banged up before we did his deal with the Ravens um, with his shoulder and we were going to have to get it done at the end of the season. Um, it was still October and we were negotiating, but I had that in the back of my mind, like we need to do this this season. And so we ended up getting the deal done and, you know, record breaking deal for Ronnie. And he signed the deal on a Friday, 48 hours later, he had a season ending injury on the Sunday. So the timing worked out in our favor. Had we waited and, you know, been stubborn and just tried to squeeze the team for a little more, that deal would never have gotten done in retrospect, you know, because of how it worked out with the injury. So I think for agents can really miscalculate on the timing of getting a deal done and how important that is. Mm -hmm. Now, I feel like, you know, obviously all this had to start somewhere. And so we won't go all the way back to, you know, elementary school or middle school or even high school, but, you know, you went to Providence, you're from, you're from the Providence area. I'm actually a big Providence basketball fan. I, I don't know why. I love that. <laughs> I'm not really sure why. I think it was uh, me and my buddy from Notre Dame. He was, he was from the Providence area as well. And so we would always catch their games. And um, it was just like a fun team to cheer for because they were underdogs, but they also right. always had talent. Yeah. And, you know, at your time at Providence, um, what, what, what were you studying in undergrad? Mm -hmm. So I was a double major in English and political science. I went in as a political science major and then I ended up staying. I, w I went to London for a semester um, and took a ton of Shakespeare classes. And I realized that I almost had enough credits for an English major as well. So I ended up when I went back to Providence, just finishing to get the degree in English as well. And then, you know, shortly after, Providence, you went to uh, Suffolk University? Is that the result? I went to Suffolk Law School, yes. I went right after college. I went to Suffolk. Um, I have a, a crazy story about law school. I switched law schools, but I will not get into that. <laughs> I 
it was not. I was, I was going to ask you, like, so why, you know, why law school? Obviously, you, you saw your dad, you know, growing up, you worked yeah. two jobs and things like that. But why, why law school? I mean, I always had a dream of being a lawyer just from uh, law and order. But yeah. as I got to school, I was like, okay, like, I'm not, I can't, I can't do all that work. But yeah. Um, I like the TV side of things and, you know, being able to just, to, you know, argue in court. But yep. what, what was it that, you know, that, that wanted you to, to, you know, go to law school and, you know, attack that path? Mm -hmm. um, I know you said don't go back to elementary school necessarily, but really since I, I think I was in first grade and we had to like pick a profession and I said lawyer, I always wanted to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. I liked arguing if there was any kind of like dispute with the outside world of my family, I was the family spokesperson, even at like 11 or 12 years old, they let me go out in front and like handle the issue. Mm -hmm. um, and I always like to take that on and, and be the one to, to kind of try and right or wrong. So it was just always the path I wanted to go down. And that's even why I chose political science and English as majors, because they say that they're, they're, they're good majors to get you prepared for law school because it's a lot of reading and writing, which is what law school entails. Um, so I just always enjoyed kind of fighting the good fight and being a zealous advocate for whomever. I just always wanted to do that. And then when I went to law school, I realized that I did want to do something a little more interesting that just kind of being a lawyer in the traditional sense. It can be boring. Uh, I won't lie. The, the legal profession can be a little bit boring and you know long hours so I want to do something that I thought was more exciting and wanted to do like sports or entertainment law mm -hmm. and kind of evolved into the agent role and even you know uh I was I would say you've always you know been in the right place at the right time and you know you talk about you have this dream and sometimes you know on your path you one dream leads you to another dream and you end up, you know, being able to to do your passion. And I believe that's what you're doing now. But, you know, even while you were in law school, you took a class sports law and you have you had a professor who happened to be an NFL agent. Right. So just, you know, probably now looking back at it, you you know, it's, it's, you're probably like, oh, everything happened for a reason. I'm supposed mm -hmm. to be an agent and things like that. But, you know, in that moment where you just, you know, trying to fill up your schedule or was there was just like immediate interest in you know becoming an intern and uh working with with them so i know i briefly touched on that i switched law schools but i was really i was enrolled in seton hall law school i had started there mm -hmm. never intended to go to suffolk um there was an issue with my apartment in hoboken new jersey and i wanted to leave and i don't know why something compelled me to reach out to suffolk it was like I considered it my safety school right. and they said, you can come here, but you have to be here tomorrow. And I don't know why I told my parents, you're taking me home. I'm going to Suffolk. And they were like, really? I said, yes, something was drawing me to that school, which is really bizarre. Um, but in retrospect, if I didn't go to Suffolk, I wouldn't have taken the sports law class with Kristen Kaliga, who was one of the very few women, especially at that time, working as an agent in the NFL. Um, and then, no, I genuinely, by that point, knew I wanted to do something in sports and entertainment. So took her class very purposefully and then, you know, made a, a huge pitch to get the internship with her because I started to realize that this is, you know, that was along the lines of what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And then even after, you know, you, you go on and you work in a litigation firm in Boston, but you still have this passion to, you know, do sports and to be an agent. And so in that time, you created your, you know, an independent, an independent agency. And, you know, you and, and they bring, this brings me back to, you know, your dad working two jobs. So now you get to that, you get to that moment. And now, you know, you're a lawyer, but then you also started an independent agency and, you know, repping, trying to start repping clients. I can't imagine the hours <laughs> that, that that took. Yeah. Um, especially so, you know, just kind of touch on that a little bit. And do you think, you know, being at the litigation firm allowed you to just continue to develop your skills, but also maybe in somewhat like if it didn't, if the agency didn't work out, you still had the litigation firm to, you know, fall back on. Did that? Yeah. You know, I think, listen, in an ideal world, I would have been able to jump right into a sports career right out of law school, but it just wasn't 
realistic because Kristen, her her agency was fairly small. It was basically just her. She was the only agent. She really didn't have the bandwidth to like hire another agent full time and bring me on board. I had student loans, so I needed to go get a legal job. And you know, now in hindsight, being twenty twenty, I think it it worked out um, for the best because. The skills that I honed in litigation, I think, are the kind of skills that can transfer to lots of different careers and professions, but especially an agent, because it's essentially advocating for a client. And so that's what I do in my world now, is build a case for why a player should receive X amount on a contract. It's the same thing that you do in litigation. And you look at cases that are similar to yours, well... On the agent side, you're looking at players and statistics that are similar to the player you're representing. So there's a lot of similarities actually in kind of what the process is to, to be an advocate for an athlete the same way a lawyer is in a, in a lawsuit. So I think that even though it was kind of painstaking working those years as a litigator, I think I'm a better agent because of it. Now, I'm, I'm sure there had to be days where you wanted to give up one of them, you know, I mean, it's... Obvious. I know which one it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I definitely struggled in the last couple of years at the law firm um, because I just was losing interest um, and really wanted to, to be an agent full time, but I just, you know, there wasn't an opportunity, so... Um, but there were many days that I thought about quitting. Yeah. And are there any um, interesting or funny stories, you know, while you were juggling both of them to where, you know, one day maybe you had to hide what you were doing or had to yes. end a call quickly or something to get on a call? Yes. I've actually told this story before, but um, I was, I took like, I don't know if it was vacation or sick days to okay. go to the combine. and. Um, my husband was actually with me, who, by the way, is the biggest Notre Dame, Notre Dame fan on the planet. Like, it's actually a problem. Um, he absolutely loves Notre Dame. Um, but anyway, he was going to come to the combine with me. And we were sitting there waiting to board the plane to Indianapolis. And I can't see far away unless I have glasses on. I'm like blind as a bat. So we're sitting there waiting to board. And one of the partners in my firm, as luck would have it, I don't even know why. I don't necessarily know that the plane was coming back from Indianapolis, but wherever he was traveling from, it was my plane that he was deboarding from that I was getting on. And he was the one that had issues with me doing both jobs. Mm -hmm. Concerned about me using my time at the law firm to do my agent work or that there'd be a conflict somehow. So he really didn't want me doing both. And then he happened to be the one getting off the plane. And my husband was like, there's... I won't name him. Um, then he has run. So I ran to the ladies' room so I could avoid him in having an awkward encounter. But we, I got, I came very close. Yeah, he was probably coming back from uh, maybe his second job. And True. We came his vacation days. Yes. <laughs> But, you know, obviously, you know, being an independent agent and starting your own, you know, agency, I'm sure there was a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff that you had to put into it personally to work. Um, for me, like self-funding a podcast and a production company is a, is a lot of, you know, I had to invest a lot of my own money and, you know, obviously time into it as well. Um, what, was that, you know, pretty much the same for you? Yeah. I mean, being an agent is not um, a cheap endeavor by any means. It's mm -hmm. take the test to sit for the test. It's at least $2,000. It was a long time ago now, so I can't remember. And I'm sure the prices have gone up. Uh, just to sit for the test. And then if you pass the test and get the license, you then need to get insurance, which is again, like another $2,000. And then you have to get licensed in all the different states where you want to recruit college players. And there's fees again in each of those states. So, and then training players, if you, if you do um, go down that path of recruiting guys out of college, paying for their training, stipends all of that so it is definitely a very big monetary investment yeah i would i would even say just you know obviously a huge leap of faith um but also you know lindsey gamble first ever client what did he do for your career 
you know, Lindsay's awesome. And it's such a small world because I think it was like a month ago, um, the gentleman that runs our marketing department here had just gotten off the phone with Lindsay. He works at a brand now and they were talking about, you know, potential deals for our clients. So life had come full circle for me. But I mean, Lindsay gave me, he was my first, first client ever to sign with me. So um, he took a leap of faith and then he gave me an opportunity to reach out to teams, have a reason to reach out to teams and start to build relationships with, you know, starting from, you know, scouts all the way up. And so had I not had a client, I wouldn't have had a reason to reach out to all 32 teams and start to have those conversations. So he enabled me to do that. And, you know, he had faith in me and I'm grateful for him for, for believing in me back then to, to be my first client. Definitely. And so, and obviously the work that you did didn't go unnoticed and you obviously were contacted by Madison out of sports and entertainment and you were with them for a little bit. And then, you know, one day they come up to you and say, they're getting rid of the, the sports side of the agency, you know, and at that moment, uh, I'm sure it probably felt just like a punch to the stomach or, you know, even just like you mentioned, you know, an athlete playing a healthy season, they come back and they get hurt. And it's just mm -hmm. like everything was going right. And then, you know, something just. Yeah. Uh, and so how did you feel receiving that info? Yeah. So I have to say the time frame between when they were deciding to divest, like the representation division mm -hmm. and when Rock Nation opportunity arose was like very short window, which is again, super fortuitous for me. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember being disappointed. And I think, you know, even I was starting to feel like this is really hard because even though I was at an agency that had resources, we didn't have anything close to like Rock Nation or the other big agencies that, you know, exist in the, in the sports world. So we were signing players of, you know, from good programs like Florida, um, even Notre Dame, we had a, a player from, but they just weren't guys that were making teams. So we were kind of spending a lot of time, a lot of energy and not obviously generating any kind of profit for the company, which you know, they have to answer to their principles. And, and that's when it was getting to a point, like we've done this two draft class and we're, you know, we haven't really been successful in so far as having a player land on a team. So I was getting to the point too, like frustrated. I wonder if this is something that I can stick with basically, if we're not going to get any traction here. And so it really happened. The rock nation opportunity happened in just the nick of time, because I probably myself would have decided that I needed to like move on to another dream because this wasn't happening. So. And then even then you talk about, you know, when you're going to Suffolk um, law school, they say you need to be there the next day. And so even, you know, your interview for rock nation, they said you need to be there the next day. Um, you know, talk about just, you know, taking that trip because I'm sure obviously with this happening and, you know, obviously all the emotions and, they're getting rid of, you know, that side of the division, they're getting rid of that division, but now this opportunity comes and you got to get there the next day. Uh, just, just talking about just times where you just took a leap of faith times where yeah. you, 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 know, you bet on yourself, honestly. It was surreal. I mean, I was like in bed watching TV and got the call and, and it was the principal at Madison Avenue that called me and said, you know, Jay, did you hear Jay-Z started a sports agency? I'm like, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, they want to do a meeting tomorrow. Can you be in New York? I was like, are you serious? He was like, yes. And even though I'm from New England and New York's not that far away, you'd be surprised. Like New Englanders don't venture out. So I didn't even know like I was getting to New York the next day, which in retrospect is sad because now I go back and forth like nothing. But so I looked into it. I like took like a limo liner. It was like this fancy van that like drove people from Boston to New York. Um, and yeah, it was just a really surreal kind of day to show up in one of the big high rises in New York city and have that meeting and get to meet Jay and, and Juan and Desiree and all the, you know, the leaders of rock nation and interview with them. It was amazing. And, um, all I can call it is surreal really coming from 
just working in Boston as a lawyer and getting that phone call. And then you even, uh, you signed your first, you know, football or Rock Nation client, Geno Smith. And obviously, you know, coming from West Virginia, he, you know, set many records with a, you know, high profile quarterback, but not talking about that moment, but what is it like seeing his growth and development as a player right now, you know, battling through the adversity that he's gone through, you know, the yeah. up and down on the depth chart to now, you know, being able to get some, get some, you know, some shine, and, you know, and starting to see his work, you know, really uh, on, on Sundays. It, it's incredible to watch and see. Um, Gino, he really, he'd been through so much here in New York um and unfairly so but it's just the way it went um to see him be patient and wait to get his opportunity and now make the most of it it's it's really awesome to watch and his mother always said and miss tracy his mom who i love dearly i always said to him um it's just as delayed not denied it's gonna happen for you gino it's just delayed just wait and she was right so, you know, he just stayed the course. He's been patient. It's tough to be playing, you know, sitting there as the backup when you know you have the talent and the skill set to be a starter. Um, but he's had to do that the past couple of years and to, to wait until this particular opportunity. And now he's making the most of it. And I think it's a great story. Yeah, I, I love watching him each and every weekend. And, you know, even his first interview, um, of that, you know, that prime time game, it was it was so surreal. It, talk, it, it mentions what you said, and it kind of makes sense on why you know he he took that moment and you know said what he said because because of his foundation, because of his mom. And so uh, I did want to ask um, before we got off: Are there any um, anything that you do for mentorship, or anything that you do for just young you know women or just young aspiring agents? Um, coming up in the industry? So we have internships here at Rock Nation um, every semester and in the summer. So definitely try and bring in folks that show an enthusiasm. And, you know, I don't necessarily just bring in female interns, but if if that's the case and get a great candidate who's a woman, I'd love to do that. Um, and then I, I make myself available. You know, if somebody reaches out to me, um, you know, on Instagram or Twitter and can hop on a call and just give some words of advice and some kind of tips, then I'm happy to do that as well. Mm -hmm. And then last thing, um, being general counsel at Rock Nation and obviously being GC, you know, anywhere is a crazy job, but just tell on the roads that you, you know, the, how many hats you have to wear at Rock. Sure. So in full transparency, it's gotten easier for me because I have a great associate general counsel um, that does a lot of the heavy lifting and day to day. Before I brought in someone in that role, I was doing all of the legal work. So at that time, it was a lot. So basically all the endorsement agreements for football players, baseball and basketball. We also had a boxing division and I was doing the legal work for boxing. Um, and then anything that touches sports. So I don't know, for instance, if there is litigation going on, I'm the liaison between the agency and outside counsel. Um, same thing for my clients. If they have some kind of legal issue going on, they like to have me involved because I can kind of speak to the lawyers on the same, the same language mm -hmm. and explain it to, to the player in more layman's terms. Um, and then things that come up like reviewing a lease um, on an apartment or um, preparing a, a chef, an agreement for like a private chef or NDAs. I give all of my clients a standard NDA that I recommend that they use if they're hiring any third parties to come into their house and become privy to any confidential information. So definitely a lot of different hats in that regard, um, you know, as a lawyer, but I'm happy to add value outside of just the the standard agent work as well. Mm -hmm. And now the official closeout. <laughs> uh, so again, you know, please follow us and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Varsity House Podcast, and follow us on all our accounts, Varsity House Podcast. And so, Tim, we thank you. And again, Rock Nation, NFL agent, and also general counsel. We appreciate your time and uh, thank you again. Thank you for having me, Sean. It was a great time. Thank you.